1993 saw a very special event in the year's rally calendar, the 25th staging of the Great Dorset Steam Fair. Although the show wasn't due to open until Wednesday the 1st of September, the action really began the weekend prior. To mark the special occasion, arrangements have been made for a railway locomotive from the nearby Swanage Railway to be used on heavy haulage demonstrations. This involved its movement on Saturday morning by steam power from Wool to Pimpern. Working on the load were three road locomotives. Len Crane with his Fowler B6 Super Lion engine, Wolverhampton Wanderer, led the way. Unfortunately, this engine was to suffer a failure on its way and sit out the entire rally steamless. Second in line was another Fowler, Paul Scully's 10-horse Duke of York, still minus its crane jib, although this may be reunited with the engine for the 1994 season. Jim Sarney brought up the rear with his 1908 eight-horse Burrell Lord Roberts acting as braking engine for the load. The fourth engine involved was the 5NHP Burrell Road Loco Conqueror, which travelled behind with a traction wagon bearing coal and a living van to provide refreshment for the crews. Over the weekend, several engines were to be seen roading into the event. Colin Knight journeyed from the New Forest area with Pandora, a Wallace and Stevens general purpose traction engine which is fitted with their unique expansion valve gear.
Many exhibits had attended the Fairford Steam Rally in Gloucestershire the weekend before, and so it was possible to spot four engines travelling from the north. May Queen, a 1913 Burrell four-horse tractor, now appears in a converted showman's guise. This engine was used for haulage up to the 1930s when the conversion was made. Another tractor covering the same route was this five-horse piston valve compound Aveling and Porter. It was used to haul one of the special exhibits for the Aveling and Porter section of the show. engine on this route was the seven horse Burrell road locomotive clinker. Mike Ward's Nottinghamshire based engine can regularly be seen roading to rallies. Also travelling in from the Fairford event was Jim Smith with the 1900 Fowler Road Loco Pride of Wales. This engine made its way via a different route from the previous three and was spotted late on Saturday on its final approach to the rally field, having covered the full journey in one day. During the bank holiday weekend, a steam rally was staged on the Isle of Wight. After returning via the Lymington Ferry, Barry 2 Sentinel S4 made tracks towards Tarrant Hinton.
The first morning of the 25th Great Dorset Steam Fair arrives and engines are still coming in off the road with seven horse general purpose Olchin engine Haven Street Queen pulling onto the site. In the Low Loader Park, Borough Road loco Lord Kitchener, visiting its first ever major rally, is driven off its loader. The six horse Burrell Crane locomotive, His Majesty, is then also driven from its loader. As the railway engine that was due to provide the load for the heavy haulage displays was still parked up in Pimper, motive power was sent out to haul it in. Meanwhile, the Great North, a 1901 10 nominal horsepower Fowler Crane locomotive, makes its way down the entrance lanes as it heads for its position in the heavy haulage section. At just after one o'clock, the road train arrives from Pimper. Due to the demise of Wolverhampton Wanderer four days earlier, the former Norman E. Box Fowler Road locomotive, Atlas, acts as a replacement in the formation.
Well, here we are at our 25th anniversary. It doesn't seem to me 25 years ago when we had over on the hill over there the first show, which consisted of seven showman's engines and I think it was 16 organs. We've certainly altered since those days and how lucky we've been with the weather. We've got the dust up here blowing today, but it's uh, far better than the mud underfoot and getting wet feet. Well, we started off 25 years ago, 1968, I think it was, if you work that backwards. And we had a great success with the first show. The reason being is I was always keen that uh, the exhibits worked in the way in which they were designed, proved and tried out. Uh, and I think the public loved this. There's no question that when engines get into the right environment, there's not a prettier sight. And uh, we've always gone for this. Now we started off in 1968, or it could be 69, I can never remember. And uh, we had a great time with the weather for three years. And then about 71, we went bang into absolutely chaotic weather for no less than eight years. And it nearly ruined us actually, but uh, we kept surviving. We were at the end of September in those days and I happened to be down on Pool Quay and an old fisherman came in and he said, are you that fella that does the steam engine show up at uh, Stour Payne Bushes? I said, yes. He said, you'll have to change your dates, my son. You come on the autumn equinox or equinox. And I said, well, what is that? He said, it's when the hours of darkness equal the hours of daylight. And he said, uh, you never get settled weather. He said, I can show you a diary where my grandfather and great grandfather would never go to sea fishing that weekend. And I thought, well, God, I must think about this. If a fella doesn't take off to earn his living because the weather's so bad, the hell are we doing up there trying to draw the public in to cornfields to try and see our show? And I got onto the Western Gazette down at Yeovil, who keep records of the weather, and I asked them what they felt of that weekend. And they said there was no question about it after they'd looked it up, that it was a very poor weekend for weather. And uh, it turned out to be that the best weather that comes up in this uh, wonderful country of ours is the first week of June. You very seldom get a wet derby, I'm told. So we thought, well, we better get off of that thing and move forward. So we came forward three weeks. It didn't seem to interfere with neighboring rallies or any of the big steam shows in the country. And we've been reasonably successful with that. I'm not gonna say we've got away with it. We've had two or three real uh, wettings again. And last year was absolutely disastrous. It was my idea last year to try and go for two weekends because it's a great, uh, bit of luck in my opinion to try and pick one weekend out of 52 to get the weather and it was my idea that if we had two weekends we get two bites of the cherry and a hundred percent more chance of fine weather but uh, what happened we had two wet weekends so that put us in the cart worse than ever and uh, a few statistics about last year's show we took 227,000 pounds on the gate in money less than in 91 uh, just the year when we wanted everything to go right so we could put on a bumper show for the 25th anniversary. We went down a real banger with the finance. But anyhow, we pushed on because I'm the sort of fella, if you think about what can go wrong, you never do anything. A great variety of rollers were present at the rally and took part daily in a parade around the site's main arena.
Well, this is the um, 25th Great uh, Dorset Steam Fair. Um, the special event this year, a special part of it, is the Aveling and Porter uh, gathering, which we're a part here. Um, we um, There's quite a good selection of engines from old um, traction engines, rollers, and going right back to a very early relic that is in the uh, adjacent marquee here that was dug up from the bottom of a coal mine they found, and that is believed to be an early, about 1860 Aveling, the earliest sort of relic yet found. Very incomplete, but um, it is an, gives an idea of what the original Avelings were like. Because um, Aveling and Porter started in about the 1800s, 1860s, Thomas Aveling in Kent, and he, he was the reputed to be the originator of the horn plate engine where the, uh, all the bearings on the back of the engine for the crankshaft, second shaft, etc., were mounted in horn plates as opposed to cast brackets mounted on the, uh, on the top of the boiler, as on the old relic I mentioned just now. Um, he gradually went, they were chain driven, then he started going into the um, gear driven engines, originally rollers, and then went on to the early traction engines in about the 1870s, and then went on through building traction engines and mainly known for rollers as you went over into the night into the 20th century and then the firm in about 1933 th in the 30s 30s became part of what they called the agricultural and general engineers it was a combine of steam engine builders including burrows and garrets i believe and that that eventually fell apart and Avelings then uh, their main factory was at Rochester in Kent up to that time. They then amalgamated with, I'm not sure it was Barford and Perkins, but somebody Barford, and called, they became Aveling Barford, and then continued to build steam engines right up to and after the war, steam rollers, supplying them to India and all over the place. And um, then the firm is still surviving, and it was under British Leyland. I'm not sure exactly who it's under now, but. Um, this firm is still in existence in Grantham. Um, going on to all the different things, as I said, they built a lot of rollers in the, from the 1900s, uh, 1890s, 1900s onwards, um, selling them all over the world. Um, in the 1920s, they changed from slide valves, such as this engine here behind you with the slide valve cylinders, to the piston valve type that was supposed to be more efficient, but a bit more awkward to handle. And, you know, drivers could come up to grief with them, but the fact that the um, piston valve would trap water in the cylinders, whereas the slide valve would let the water go. It would knock off the face if you got water trapped. So it ended up with a lot of damaged engines, cranks, bent cranks, etc. built a certain amount of traction engines, light tractors. They were building them up into the 20s as well. And there are examples of those here in this uh, display. Um, as I say, the rollers were built right into the Aveling Barford period, and they ended up again as piston valve rollers. Um, ploughing engines, they built quite a few, um, I say quite a few, nowhere near what Fowler's built, but built some ploughing engines. And there is one here that was rescued from the Sahara Desert. In a, it's now in an incomplete state, but um, very well preserved because of the atmosphere it was um, left in. And no doubt the owner will make that, build that up again. And we shall have three in the country. There's only two others in the moment at Norfolk. At the moment in Norfolk. Uh, also here we've got a Aveling tractor from about the 1910, 1919 sort of period 
that was rescued from Loch Ness, so it had fallen into Loch Ness and was rescued in more or less complete condition fairly recently, but very in a very rusty state. And whether the new owner will ever get round to um, repairing it and um, making good all the ravages of 30, 40, 50 years, whatever it was underwater, I don't know. Our engine here was bought by my brother and myself in 1964. It was supplied new 6th of September 1905 to James Buchanan at Lavington Park, Petworth in Sussex. And it was for his general estate use. This is a convertible engine. That means that it could be converted from a traction engine to a roller, and it was a thing that was very much in vogue in the late 1900s, early, early say, late 19th century, early 20th century, and it meant that a, per, a firm or a state could buy an engine to do two jobs. You could take the, it was, there's a flange on the front that carries a saddle. You bolt the saddle on the front, and the also front forks with it put and rollers take the front wheels out remove the back wheels and put smooth wheels on and then you could also fit the scrapers etc and you ended up with a roller uh, it was rather a laborious thing when you think there were no forklifts and that sort of thing in those days but it say in the long run saved a lot of money for an estate saved the price of two engines so this is a, a six nominal horsepower compound slide valve engine it's, um, as I say, compound, that means that it uh, uses the steam from the high-pressure side to the low-pressure side before it exhausts, so it is, um, saves um, water and fuel, especially not so important in our preservation days, but of course it was in working days when, um, when uh, coal and everything went money and fetching water time. Um, it attended the, Aveling, the centenary of Thomas Aveling's death at Chatham, um, Rochester, and it's been to every, attended every one of these Dorset steam events, uh, all 25 of them. An interesting exhibit at the 25th Great Dorset Steam Fair was the 1907 American-built case traction engine. This was its first rally in steam following a major boiler overhaul. Rated at 12 horsepower under the American rating system, Engines of this size are very rare in preservation, even in the States. Marshalls built many horizontal and vertical stationary steam engines, ranging from 3 nominal horsepower to in excess of 30 nominal horsepower. This Model MP is rated at 5 horsepower and was bought new in 1909 by Cheshire Area Health Authority, being used to power a hospital laundry. It is a single cylinder slide valve engine known as a banjo engine due to the crankcase shape. Steam is provided by a Morris boiler built by Henry Coltmans of Loughborough.
Working engines are always a major feature of the Great Dorset Steam Fair and the 1993 event was no exception to the rule. Goliath is an early example of a Wallace and Stevens three-ton, three nominal horsepower tractor being built in 1902. The initial history of this engine is unknown, although it is known latterly to have worked in Warner's Brick and Tile Works at Knoll Hill near Reading. The Wallace and Stevens tractor has been present at all 25 Great Dorset steam fairs and was seen driving a 36-inch Ransom's threshing drum. These lightweight machines were manufactured for farmers with around 250 acres of cornfields. Built in 1944, this example worked most of its life in the Hampshire area. Working alongside the Wallace was one of only two surviving four-horse man tractors. Built in 1918, this engine spent its entire working life on the Isle of Anglesey. An interesting feature is its gear-driven steering system, as opposed to the more normal chain arrangement. The engine was used on threshing and wood sewing duties, but on this occasion was seen driving a 1948 Ross Junior Baylor. The Fairford Rocket is a 7 NHP Marshall general purpose engine built at the Gainsborough factory in 1914. The single cylinder slide valve engine was in a derelict state when purchased by the current owners in 1987 and has since been fully overhauled. It was teamed up with a 1943 54 inch Marshall threshing machine that has been in the Dorset area from new. This stationary baler dates from 1940 and was built by Walter W. Powell of Kirkby, Liverpool. Power to drive the machine was provided by a five-horse Ruston Proctor agricultural engine named Corn Maiden. This engine was built in 1918 for the war office but was never actually used by them. It was sold at a government sale in 1920 and worked on threshing duties up to 1950. In the wood sawing area, the McLaren general purpose engine, the Mac, could be seen at work. McLarens were built in Leeds, with this six nominal horsepower single being turned out of the factory in 1894. The engine was coupled up to a Stenner No. 2 portable self-feed rack saw bench. Dating from around 1920, this bench is completely original. One of the largest stone crushers ever seen at the Great Dorset Steam Fair was displayed by Bob Davies. This was driven by his 1902 Garrett 6 NHP agricultural engine Lucy, which is believed to be the oldest Garrett in existence.
The Crusher, dating from 1917, is one of the oldest and heaviest crushers in existence and worked in a Derbyshire quarry. Stone was loaded into the 15 by 24 inch jaws by a late 1940s Ruston Bazirus 10RB. This machine is fitted with a clam shovel. cars were to be seen on display. This 1908 example is a 10 horsepower Stanley. Its boiler is fitted with burners that run on unleaded petrol. The vehicle is capable of 60 miles per hour with a fuel consumption of 17 mpg. It has a double acting twin cylinder engine but no clutch or gearbox. Another car built in 1908 is the larger 20 horsepower White. This is believed to be the only model L White in the UK, but there are known to be seven surviving in America. The two-seater mobile generates six and a half horsepower with a boiler pressure of 150 pounds per square inch. There he is coming around again, giving me his proverbial Salute. Let's hope you clean the brass on there, Tony, and that lovely old yeah, two finger salute that time. Now the little red buggy you see going around there is the steam buggy. Here we are in front of some of the plough engines in the plough engine section or the steam ploughing section of the Dorset Steam Fair at its 25th anniversary. There's been steam ploughing at all the events here over the last 25 years and they've always been very well supported and they've always been very interesting for all the spectators. The engine we're in front of is one of the engines that's been attending probably more events here than any of the other engines, number 1368, which is a Fowler single-cylinder engine um, built in the 1800s. It's got a sister engine here which it worked with for many years and it is part of a set of pair of engines. Plough engines worked in pairs, one engine on either side of the field and it pulled a plough or a cultivator by means of the cable drum mounted underneath the engine. Steam ploughing was at its heyday in the late 1800s and early 1900s when thousands and thousands of acres of land, both in this country and abroad, were developed for food production. Fowlers were the main producers of plough engines, but there were various other makes, such as McLaren and Aveling and Porter. Two sorts of cultivation were generally done. One was ploughing, where the land was ploughed in the normal way that it is today by a plough being pulled through the ground and the land being turned over. The other method of cultivation was by the use of a cultivator, which was a pronged instrument that was dropped into the ground and dragged through the ground. It broke the ground rather than turning it over. and It broke it up into large clods when it was left to settle through weathering and was then harrowed, ready for a harvest to be sown onto it. As you can see from here, you have a crankshaft which actually drives the engine and makes it go along. Fixed to the end of the crankshaft, you have a drive gear which transfers the drive vertically downwards through this shaft it's then operated by means of this clutch lever to put the clutch in and out, which then drives the gear 
onto the large drum under the engine. And this would hold, depending on the size and class of the engine, varying, varying lengths of rope, 400 yards, 300, or even more of rope. And as you can see, the, the, the drive shaft here transfers the drive into a horizontal motion and takes the rope out to the engine, from the engine to the plough or cultivator, and the engine is then ready for work. The two BB1 class engines, which are called Victory and Dreadnought, worked for many years for a ploughing cultivator. And these engines were sold to contractors who would work them up and down the country, opening up large tracts of land because one of the benefits of a plough engine was that it could work and open up land that other horse-drawn implements couldn't, couldn't work on. These engines are amongst the most common of the classes in this country, the BB1 class. All the engines in preservation, the BB1 is the most common class in, this, in England, although much larger engines were generally sold on the export market. These engines have been owned by a variety of owners, up till recently were owned by Robert Coles of Shaftesbury, but the engines have recently changed hands to a new owner. Obviously, in the fields that they were working in, in the days when they were being used commercially, the engines would frequently be out of sight of one another. But in, even if they were in sight of one another, the engines had, or the drivers, had to be able to communicate with each other. And this they would do by means of whistles. And it would generally be two for start and one for stop. So you could hear engines over a very large distance and communicate safely and quickly. The two sorts of ploughs that were used were balance plough and anti-balance plough. And an anti-balance plough was a plough that had an axle that moved and was a very much easier plough to manoeuvre at the end of each bout than the balance plough, which only had a, a fixed axle and needed a lot more effort to manhandle. Because as you realize, the steam plow, by its very unusual nature, was a double-ended plow. So that on one bout, the plow was pulled through the ground to the far engine, and then the whole plow was tipped up on, on its axle, ready for pulling back to the engine on the other side of the field.
the cultivator was worked in the similar sort of way being pulled across the field between the two engines. It had a Y mechanism on the front of it so that when the cultivator got to the far end of the field, the engine from the, the part of the field it had just come from would pull the whole cultivator round on its own axis. As it pulled round, the tines were automatically pulled up out of the ground. The whole cultivator was turned facing back the way it had come. The, the steersman on the cultivator pulled the large lever on the cultivator, which went back into the ground with a bang, and then the cultivator was pulled back across the field. And then the whole thick process was repeated at the far end. Working with the cultivator at the top of the field was the Fowler BB1 number 15164. The engine had appeared at the 1991 Great Dorset Steam Fair in a derelict condition. Built in 1918 and rated at 16 nominal horsepower, this BB1 spent its working life in the Yorkshire area. At the bottom of the field was the 1872 single-cylinder 14-horse Fowler Noreen. This engine was supplied new to Beebe Brothers of Rempstone and was rebuilt by Allens of Oxford in the early 1900s. Another implement worked by the two engines was the 1920s Fowler Combination Cultivator. There are only two or three of this kind of implement in existence nowadays and this example comprises a combination of cultivator, roller and harrow. A demonstration of direct ploughing was given with the 1908 Marshall seven horse single general purpose engine Margaret teamed up with a Ransom three furrow steering plan. This year's uh, 
Great Dorset Steam for a heavy haulage section. Um, from the 25th anniversary, has tried to put on something a bit special. So it was decided that uh, we would haul a railway locomotive from Wool up to the site here, uh, using three engines, two fowlers and a barrel at the rear pushing, or braking, whichever the case may be. And uh, this proved to be very popular along the route. Uh, as literally thousands turned out to see it and um, it's also provided a tremendous amount of interest here on the site where we've been giving demonstrations um, of uh, the engines hauling. The loco itself isn't over heavy, I suppose it's about 20 odd tonnes, the trailer's 30 so that's 50. The gross train weight, believe it or not, is somewhere around 117 tonnes. So it's all got to be pushed up the hills and down the dales. So uh, three engines want to do it on its own, really, but three look more, more the part. Gives the public something to look at, much more spectacular show. We've got this year uh, two McLaren Road locomotives, which we haven't had before. John uh, Blagg has brought Dane Captain Scott. It's been under heavy repairs for a few years. Got a nice selection of burrow engines. And we've also got three big Fowler B6s, which uh, is most unusual to say the least of it. Uh, any, any show in England, uh, I suppose it, if it happened at all, it had only happened down here. So hopefully uh, with two other trailers which we've got, one is an eight-wheel bogey built in 1910, which has got a dynamo on it which weighs somewhere around 30 tonnes, including the weight of the trailer. We've got another trailer, a drop-neck trailer with some stone on, which weighs somewhere about 40 tonnes. So all in all, we've got a bit of weight to pull around, so it makes the engines work quite hard. Preparations are made to haul the railway locomotive around the heavy haulage circuit with Jim Smith's 1900 six-horse Fowler A4 road loco moving into position. Very shortly. I'll tell you something about the three engines. The, this is the front one. It's going to be the six-horsepower Fowler built in 1900 and spent its working life in Wales. The eight-horse Burrell Lord Roberts also makes its way towards the load. The Fowler, which was supplied new to a haulage contractor in North Wales, is reversed and coupled onto the load in readiness for the whistle signal and the move off.
The railway engine and trailer is eased gradually downhill by the three engines, which include number 1652 Bodicea, one of the only two surviving 10 nominal horsepower, three-speed compound McLaren road locos. With the foul of Pride of Wales heading the lineup, Lord Roberts brought up the rear as braking engine. So here they come very, very gently. Crews will be firing up now, ready for the next storm up the other side there. But at the moment, they're using the engines to hold this train back. Now, have to keep the tension on it all the time. The engine on the back is breaking that load, it's using the engine to hold everything back, keep the whole thing straight in line. As I would say, this is where the skill of the crew really comes into play. There are brakes on the trailer, as you can see, we have the two brakes in there, along the side Steam tractors also provided pulling power in the heavy haulage section. Here, a four nominal horsepower Wallace and Stevens compound from 1920 is teamed up with a 1917 Fowler Tiger tractor to haul the load of stone. Oh, hello, we've got these smaller boys having a go now. We have this. Dyson trailer uh, on which two of the train engines spent the other morning loading the stone. And um, we've now got the, uh, the lads with the tractors uh, saying that they can do just as well. Let's see what happens. Now the leading engine is a Wallace and Stevens oil bar tractor. Um, the motion on this is enclosed in an oil bar. The idea being to keep dust and grit out. A lot of them were used for furniture hauling. They had the large pan technicans that had been previously horse drawn, and they put a draw bar on and moved furniture with them with engines such as this. But they also did a fair amount of heavy hauling on the road. Let's see what sort of job they make of it now.
The big load is once again moved by a combination of Fowler and Burrell power. This time the leading engine is Burrell Road Loco Clinker, followed by Paul Scholes Fowler, the Duke of York, with the second Burrell, His Majesty, the six-horse Crane Loco bringing up the rear. Clyde is one of few surviving Aveling and Porter Road locomotives. Built in 1914, this six-horse, three-speed compound engine demonstrates its capabilities pulling the generator. Showing the pulling power of agricultural engines was this single-cylinder Alchin working impressively on the climb. After the Alchin had passed, the newly restored 1917 seven nominal horsepower Fowler Windrush worked up the hill. This engine is fitted with a belly mounted winch drum and was ordered new by the Ministry of Munitions 
for moving and winching heavy guns. The railway loco's weight proved to be no problem for a pair of fowlers with the 8-horse B6 Atlas on the front and the 8-horse B5 crane engine, the Great North, at the rear. On the second circuit, Steve Neville's 1914 Burrell Road loco, Duke of Kent, was hitched to the front to assist the Fowlers. Crane locomotive His Majesty was put to good use loading logs onto a Tasker trailer. A rarity was then witnessed, with the Tasker trailer being linked up to a Tasker B2 chain-driven tractor. Another demonstration of timber hauling was given by Princess Mary, a 1918 Ford NHP Garrett tractor. The much-worked six-horse Burrell Crane Loco, which had been supplied new in 1921 to Hickey's Boilermakers, was once again seen in action, this time on the trailer loaded with stone.
10 horse McLaren Bodicea also stretched its legs on the load of stone. Smaller eight horse three speed compound McLaren Road Loco, Captain Scott, featured in the lineup as braking engine on our final look at the heavy load. Heading the load was Richard Sandercock's 1924 Burrell Conqueror and the Fowler B6 Duke of York making its second appearance. This year, I was very proud, in fact, 
that we had a hundred showman's engines. We did make it in the finish. I got to admit that I had to put a few at the end of little miniatures in to make up the number, but nevertheless, they are a showman's engine, and it was my ambition for the 25th anniversary to get a hundred showman's engines, and we done it. In fact, we had 93 biggins and tractors, and I made up the balance with seven miniatures. So we weren't cheating, and we weren't telling any lies about it. We had a hundred and my god did they ever not look nice we had them put through the top of the fair there or in front of the fair in rows of three and uh, they really did look a picture there's no question about that they looked absolutely superb and with the old fairground behind it it was a lovely spectacle there's a man here who works for walt disney in america at disneyland and he said he's been over before and there is nothing in Disneyland that can compare to a Saturday night here, which I thought was very, very nice. There's, there's no question about it. I think what we lay on here with that picturesque uh, showman's engine lineup or lineups, it will be now, I suppose, with the fairground behind it, there is nothing to compete with it in the world. I'm quite convinced of that. I've been and seen a few of the highlights around the world and uh, I don't think there's anything to compete with it. Of course, I. I actually uh, got me heart and soul and I love to see the old fairground organs and the showman's engine so I suppose I am a bit biased but I think that uh, if anybody's truthful to see that line up or line ups going through in front of that fair is really rather breathtaking and uh, I was very very proud to think that uh, we had a hundred of them there and they were machines that were built when England was workshop to the world there's no question about it, even the Americans, the Germans, people on the continent could never put together a piece of machinery in steam engine uh, form like the great British workmen of the sort of uh, end of the last century and up through to, well, the end of the Second World War. They were superb machines, beautifully built, they looked well, everything looked right on them and no matter who tried, wherever they were, they could never match what was made in this country was steam. It really made my day among those 94 big engines, or 100 in total, that we had come over by Lord O'Neill from Shane's Castle, Colvadis. Now, Colvadis was purchased by the late Mr. Edward Hine in the 60s and completely rebuilt. And John Garrett and I used to take that engine round the country, and it was always used to advertise our event and we used that engine for the first 15 or 16 years of the show and it became quite a symbol to us. It was more or less like the gollywog was with Robinson's Jam or uh, whatever symbol people use on everything as Quo Vadis used to be to the Great Dorset Steam Fair. It brought back many memories to me and we were delighted to see her back over here on Dorset soil. Stood adjacent to Quo Vardis was the 10 horse Fowler Super Lion Showman's Road Loco Supreme. Dawn of the Century was another 10 NHP Fowler on display, having been transported all the way from Dunfermline in Scotland. Bearing the wording plain but powerful, renown, the 8 NHP Fowler, isn't decorated with the usual twisted brasses. This engine is fitted with a Thompson Watson feast crane in order to assist with the build-up of fairground rides. Renown was situated side by side with sister engine Repulse, both having been built in 1920 for the Gateshead showman John Murphy. Both the Fowlers are hard-working engines nowadays, with Repulse on this occasion witnessed generating for the Dodgems. A fine sight was that of three burrows that used to work together on the Anderton and Rowland fairgrounds in the West Country. The seven horse engines Princess Mary and Gladiator were on either side of the eight horse scenic showman's road loco Dragon. Brown and May produced steam engines at Devizes in Wiltshire. General Buller was the last showman's engine to be turned out by them in 1912 and is the only survivor. McLarens of Leeds were represented by the Banshee. This eight horse engine was originally built as a crane engine in 1919 and was converted to a showman's road loco around 1945. A second McLaren on show was Goliath. 
It was supplied new in 1917 to the War Office and converted in 1919. Now owned by Frank Lithgow, the McLaren was situated next to his 1925 Burrell Dolphin, this being the last showman's turned out of the Thetford Works. Steam-driven rides on the fairground included the Gallopers owned by the Downs family. Built around 1895 by Savages of King's Lynn, the ride has a centre engine which came from a four abreast set of Gallopers. The organ is an 89-key Gaviola. The 1900 twin steam yachts spent their working life in the Yorkshire area with Henry Waddington and then Harry Lee before passing into preservation. They are driven by an 810HP Savage centre engine. As the 25th Great Dorset Steam Fair came to a close, the steam yachts, along with the rest of the fairground, were dismantled piece by piece. Renown, using its crane, was brought into use to assist in the task. Now, we've done fairly well here this year. There's no question about that, because uh, the crowds, and I could tell by the car parks, was absolutely chock a block full, and I am told that the attendance yesterday afternoon uh, had reached 200,000 and we've had several thousand people in since then. So it's my ambition achieved that 200,000 people have been to visit the Great Dorset Steam Fair in one session. And uh, that was an ambition I always had my eyes set on because I knew if the budget was right, 200,000 people plus came in, we were on safe ground to make the job continue. So there's no question about it, we shall be going ahead for 1994 and uh, the dates are the 31st of August until the 4th of September, although it said in the programme the 3rd of September, it looked as though we weren't going to be operational on the Sunday, but I can assure you that we are, we shall be from Wednesday to Sunday, that is the Wednesday after August bank holiday through and uh, we only hope that uh, we get the continued r uh, rain, I was going to say, we get the continued sunshine uh, of what we've had for this uh, 25th anniversary show. With the conclusion of the largest steam spectacle in the country for another year, Jim Smith travels northbound with his engine, the Pride of Wales, and the long journey to the engine's Nottinghamshire base in front of him. <laughs> 